I wish that AI could write these podcast intros for me. Like I would just give it the transcript of the episode and it spits out a witty and engaging introduction. It's not that the technology doesn't exist. It does. And I did try it with this episode. I gave ChatGPT a few prompts and I told it in broad strokes what we discussed in this conversation. And if you don't know what ChatGPT is yet, you will by the end of this podcast. And it gave me an intro that was factually correct, but not quite there. I was going to read it to you, but it would have had you hitting that skip button like crazy or fall asleep while driving. So why am I talking about AI and why is the word blockchain in the title for a podcast by veterinarians for veterinarians? That was a line from the chat GPT intro. Isn't blockchain for Bitcoin and stuff? We're talking about it because while the blockchain is used in cryptocurrency and while AI may write boring solace podcast introductions, there's way more to it. For example, AI is very good at learning and using facts and our profession is full of those. And sooner or later, probably sooner, it'll be better than you at quite a lot of things. So in this episode, we'll explore where we're at with AI in Vetland, how we can use it now, how not to get sucked into the hype and let it land you in trouble, how to turn Nirvana lyrics into Shakespeare, and much more. But with all of these changes, we'll have information, even more data than we already have now. Lots and lots of data. And you may not have noticed but the systems we currently have to manage data in our vet businesses kind of suck. So we're taking a look at that in this episode as well. And before you go, I'm not techie. You lost me at data. This episode isn't for me. Hang on. We'll be talking about some really cool ways to improve all the reasons why you currently hate tech and data management. So who is Steve and why him for this topic? Dr. Steve Joslin is a specialist veterinary radiologist and also a total tech enthusiast who's dedicated his career to fixing what he sees as one of the biggest yet insidious problems in the industry today, the patient data disconnect. Keep listening to learn what that means. With over two decades of experience consulting for referral, teaching, and general practice hospitals on four continents, Steve is highly regarded for his radiology work on designing imaging workflows and clinical 3D printing services, among other groundbreaking projects. Steve's passion for technology and informatics led him to co-chair a joint American and European radiology committee exploring the role that AI has to play in veterinary diagnostic imaging. But it's his current project, VETI, where Steve and his team are using blockchain technology to create a universal health record that locks patient data to an animal's existing microchip that's really making waves in the industry and revolutionizing the way that veterinary data is collected and disseminated. We'll explain how. But Steve is not some soulless tech bot. He's flesh and bone human with human challenges. So of course, I pick at the frayed edges of Steve's humanness to see what we can learn from him. Steve tells us about his career journey, including some great insights for someone considering a residency and specifically a career in radiology and imaging. Steve also shares candidly what he learned from his experience living through a real-life, full-blown, work-related breakdown episode. So... Please enjoy what has to be the most eclectic mix of topics we've ever mixed together in a single episode here on The Vet Vault as we dive deep into the mind of this innovative thinker and disruptor with Dr. Steve Jocelyn. But before you jump in, and this isn't an ad and it isn't a sponsored section, it's just a shout out for a very cool opportunity hosted by a good friend and a previous guest on the podcast, Dr. Jeanette Kessels, back from episode 77. If you listen to that episode, you'll know that Jeanette is the founder and chair of Vets for Climate Action, a charity that focuses on the role that we as vets can play in the fight against climate change, and specifically around the impacts that climate change will have on animal populations. Because, you know, animals are kind of our thing. At the end of June, Vets for Climate Action are hosting an epic fundraising event with a four-day hike at the Laparinta Track. Where the hell is Laparinta, you ask? Exactly, I say. It's nowhere. It's in the middle of this big red continent, nearish to Alice Springs. And it's very far away from your everyday life. Far enough to provide you with a whole new perspective from where you'll be sleeping under a sky vast enough to let your soul spread to its fullest extent. And it's no ordeal of a hiking trip. Challenging, yes, but also a little bit luxurious with nice hotels at either end, a guide that hikes with you, and comfy beds at the end of each day's hike. I think I've just convinced myself to go. Link, as always, in the show description. 
it's for a very good cause and it will be an amazing experience. So book it now. Even though the space out there is limitless, spaces on this trip are not. Okay, Steve, AI, breakdowns, career shifts. Let's go. Dr. Steve Joslin, welcome finally to the Vet Vault. No, I've been on the Vet Vault before, just finally in this capacity. What do you mean you've been on the... Ah, of course. The clinical. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a good point. So welcome to the, what we call the Thrive Vet Vault, where we talk about life and not about clinical stuff. That's right. Thank you for having me. I'm obviously a big fan. Been pretty much your number one fanboy from the beginning. Well, you were literally, we were friends before we even started it. So you, you had to support <laughs> it whether you liked it or not. <laughs> so where shall we begin? Where shall we begin? Do you know Esther Perel? The is a very famous psychologist, relationship psychologist. She's got a very famous podcast and books, books about infidelity and stuff like that. <sighs> Her podcast is called Where Shall We Begin? Which I often, for a psychologist who talks about relationship stuff, I often think, where shall we begin? Sounds like you're in trouble. It sounds like she's saying, yeah, this is going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> Go and get the lube. Let's get started. <laughs> oh, God. Cancel my one o'clock. No, I'm, I'm intrigued as to what question you're about to ask me then. <laughs> no, it's not like, this one's not like that. <laughs> Let's start with the standard question, the bad decisions. If you see that sign, if you drive up Sterling Highway in Perth, on the left is a building that has these beautiful murals on. And at a stage, the mural was a big sign that said, Bad decisions lead to good stories. And I like that statement. And I often wonder, is that is that true? Do bad decisions lead to good stories? And if you think it is, have you got an example for me? Yeah, uh, I guess bad decisions always lead to stories. That's That's fairly true. I think I look at that as, did you get any good learnings out of it? But good stories, oh man, I've, like there's so many bad decisions in life that I've made that I wish I didn't. Um, but yeah, they always have a story. I think if you're not remembering a bad decision, then it was probably pretty boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, we've got to define what makes a good story. A good story doesn't mean a happy story. Like some of the <sighs> some of the best movies out there are not happy movies, but it's just a it's a story, right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, I guess like, I mean, a lot of the work related bad decisions, like, you know, us deciding a, to go a certain direction and it ended up being a bad decision. Well, shit, we learned something out of that. That's, that's super valuable. But the life bad decisions, I mean, yeah, I was just talking to Ella about that question that, that I knew that you were probably going to ask. And it's, oh man, I, like I, I can go through two or three bad decisions in the last couple of years and it, they're haunting. And I'm not necessarily sure if it's uh, it's probably what you wanted to, to hear, but like, I don't know, just the car accident I, I, I was in. Mm -hmm. And that came down to just taking a shortcut and thinking that I could beat some traffic. And that turned into a good couple of years of, of pain and anguish that uh, I wish I didn't take that shortcut, you know? So yeah, that's kind of a little bit more dark, but in terms of like bad decisions, Good stories. Oh, they're almost they're almost a good decision then because <laughs> the story itself will survive. Um, if I think about the like business wise, yeah, bad decision was was quitting cold turkey or I guess quitting a really good high paying job that allows me to work beachside in Fremantle and uh, starting a business with complete naivety and complete um, wishful thinking. And in the long run, that's probably a good decision. But at the time, that would have been a really bad decision. And I think <laughs> I would recommend many people do that. <laughs> so, All right, let's dig in. So, <laughs> let's recap that, that story then. So put us in that time frame. What is the good job and what did you leave it for? And then we're going to talk about the why. Yeah, sure. The, I mean, the good job was coming back to to Fremantle, to Perth in Australia mm -hmm. and living five minute walk to, from the beach and a 10 minute walk to work past cafes in the morning and reading teleradiology cases from around the world, from Brazil, Hong Kong, the U S 
the UK, picking up the phone, talking to these people and finishing by sort of three, four o'clock in the afternoon, hitting the beach and maybe the pub on the way home. Like that, that was the absolute dream. And the bad decision economically was, you know, giving that up and risking that. I think I have a bunch of privilege in terms of I can always go back to that sort of work, but that was not a calculated business decision or economic decision. It was just an opportunity that I thought I wanted to take. And so that's that it is the dream job. And and I think when I tell people that you can work at the hours that you want, anywhere you want, and see the most amazing cases all the time, that's that's a dream job. And yeah, the bad decision at the time was giving that up in hindsight. I think it was a great decision. Oh, so many places to go. Well let's just, let's double click quickly on that dream job for people listening to this, where you are talking to vets who make career decisions. I, mean, I seriously considered doing imaging, doing radiology specialization, because I pictured it to be that dream job, you know, much more flexibility, get less dog shit on you and anal gland. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that a, a, a so the main reason I didn't do it is I just didn't get the opportunity for a residency or anything like that at the time was was too hard and I'm too dumb. So that's, uh, <laughs> it wasn't going to work. But uh, a- am I flawed in my thinking that it is that dream? Because from what you're describing, it sure sounds like a pretty, pretty damn good dream job. What are the downsides? Yeah, I, I mean, just a, a couple of things there. You're definitely not too dumb. I think anybody listening, like it's, it's not a matter of too dumb. It's just how much work you have to put into it. Okay, too lazy then. Too lazy. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Or also your life circumstance makes it hard. Like you probably had a family yeah, at yeah. the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that just makes it super impossible. Um but yeah, the doubt I mean, I guess be, the work to get to that dream job is not easy. It's not like, you know, watching neighbors when they take three episodes off and they come back as a doctor or, or a teacher <laughs> sort of thing, right? It's a it's a long journey and it's not easy. It's not easy to get a residency, especially mm-hmm. now. It's not easy to get an internship that qualifies you for a residency, or even sometimes you need a PhD to qualify for the residency. That is the hardest part. And I think you know that also reflects on what happened at vet school. The hardest part of, was getting into vet school. And mm-hmm. of course, vet school is hard and, and been, you know, might take a little while, but the first big hump was getting into vet school. And during the residencies, you're on a student stipend. So you're living very, very basically. You're working extreme hours, late hours. And from a radiology side, that's a lot better than what the poor surgeons or the medics or the emergency residents. And it's all of that is the, the da- not, I guess, the downside or just the realities of getting there. Mm-hmm. And then the downsides to that dream job. I mean, that was a very specific teleradiology role where you could work anywhere in the world, provided the internet was great. But there's a downside to that. It's like, if you're a social person, you want to sit over coffees and talk about cases or interesting things or, and you don't get that. Like the, the report comes in at most your interaction with that person is seeing their name on the request and their frantic sort of urgency to get that report back. <laughs> yeah. And then you report it. You're saying, this is really cool. I'd love to know what you find please let me know. And you don't hear anything at all. And the next time you hear from them is another case. You don't know if that, that was correct. You don't know how well that patient did. You don't know if they're happy with your report. I think the fact that they come back to you for more requests means that they're happy, but you just don't, it, it, it starts and stops right there with that report. And that, that's a little bit, um, I guess taxing. Yeah. But again, that's the downside to this great job where you can live and work anywhere. There's, stories of these teleradiologists that are living in Bali or castles in Scotland and moving around the world because they can. So, you know, the company I was working for, they sponsor and move radiologists to Australia. And it's like, wow, you get to move to this beautiful place. In retrospect for me, because I, I like scanning, like I like ultrasound, but I, I thought I liked it because I liked ultrasound but i didn't i'd like that piece of the puzzle of solving a clinical case yeah. but when i started digging deeper 
uh, with the radiologist and going learning, I was like, yeah, I, I get annoyed with the level of detail and specificity that you have to have as an actual magician. Uh, and then the same for radiology. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of, in retrospect, and now and doing what I do now where I sit at a desk staring at a screen quite a lot, I go, yeah, that sounds like a great idea when you're working 10-hour days on your feet, 12-hour days on your feet, and it's lots of people and noise and stress and problems. And the idea of sitting in a room by myself working in a quiet environment sounded super appealing. The reality is actually not exactly what you're saying. It can get really yeah. lonesome almost and um, you know, staring at a screen and high level of detail and typing out detailed reports actually doesn't suit my personality. So what, what suits my personality yeah. is remote work when I want and, and a good salary. <laughs> that yeah. works, but the actual work, maybe not. Yeah. There's three things there. You said diagnostic magician. It's more diagnostic imaginer, I think, yeah. rather than <laughs> magician. magician um, okay. But cool. the... Yeah, I think some of these companies recognize this as well. They'll recommend you have one day of clinical work. So where you work for a university one day a week or refer a hospital. And that provides a lot more balance. But also the, the teleradiology world is so busy. And they would take you 10 days a week if they could. And wow. it's just not sustainable that way. It's, it, it's just exploding around the world. There's so much work. Wow. And also so much need for more radiologists, despite all the tech that's coming, but not enough training positions at universities because, you know, a university clinician is going to work for a university set salary, but knowing that private practice or teleradiology is going to pay him two or three times the salary to sit in Bali. And it's very hard to keep academic radiologists in institutions training. And so now they're relooking at how we train radiologists. Like, do we need to be at the university? There's a hundred million cases out there. Surely mm. a teleradiology center could support a new training sort of schedule. Because what we look at, um, we can load that same case up exactly how the radiologist sees it for a resident two years later. And in surgery and medicine, you kind of can't do that. Like it's very mm. hands-on and mm. case by case, physical experience doing that. So it's going to be interesting how they start training radiologists the next few years, but um, massive demand for it. It's a great job. Uh, I, I definitely recommend it to anybody. So to, let's talk and about- I, your... And I stopped doing it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. Don't you worry. But let's quickly talk about your, your journey. For somebody who is listening to this going, yeah, that sounds like me. I want to do that the process and you alluded to it here that maybe a couple of years from now that it'll be a whole different process but for now what did your journey look like because I'll, I'll tell you part of the reason i didn't do it i joked and said i was too too dumb and too lazy but exactly that i had a family the eldest was about to start school I, I had a community of friends around me that i liked living and my options were yeah. there was one in melbourne that i could have applied for um, I don't think I would have gotten it because I didn't have the PhD and the internship and the blah, blah, blah. Um, I, memberships I, or... I could have. Yeah. I had an opportunity actually to potentially go do it back in South Africa. But at my life stage, I wasn't moving countries and selling my home and doing all of that to go and do it. So what did yours look like? Did you have to move? What did you sacrifice to get to this point? Yeah, uh, incredibly fortunate. Should I start back at vet school because like, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, the yeah. radiology thing kind of, it, it all started there. So okay. actually it starts earlier. I, I was really fascinated by physics in high school and that was really my, my bread and butter sort of classes. That so I you've always been a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. What's that left side of brain person. And <laughs> okay. that sort of stuff just makes sense to me. Numbers yeah. and, and that. And I'm not, not trying to brag. It's just that the other side of it, the, the emotional <laughs> intelligence or the creative side, horrible. Anyway. instruments no art no not at all so when i got to vet school and i was fascinated with medicine and it was either gonna be doctor or vet but i saw a vet practice and it was extremely chill and fun and every time i went to the doctor it seemed like the most serious place in the world so that was really what got me to vet school at vet school i didn't see any physics at all really until fourth year and fifth year when you start studying either fluid dynamics and anesthesia or particle physics and radiology. And, and that just instantly captivated me. And I also had some pretty amazing radiologists at the time. So we 
had Vicki Johnson from Vet CT. She was teaching mm -hmm. us at the time. And we had Belinda Hopper and Zoe. And they were super enthusiastic about that work. And it was almost infectious. And that's, I kind of decided that's exactly what I wanted to do. Yet all of them said, hey, maybe go get some clinical experience because this is a big decision you're kind of making your life on right now. And so I thought that's a great idea. I'll go and do equine practice for a couple of years. That was a horrible decision, actually. <laughs> What, the equine practice? I loved equine practice. Like, it was so much fun. I, I was working in Sunshine Coast at the racetrack practice there. I learned a, a bunch. You're driving around, seeing different properties, having lunch on the road, or people make you lunch sometimes. That was amazing. But then I'm like, cool, I want to do a radiology residency now. I'm just, you know, like neighbors. I'll, I'll head away for a couple months and come back as a radiologist. What do they call it in the movies? Cue the montage. Like yeah, the montage. <laughs> <laughs> da -da -da -da. <laughs> so then I get to the UK and so I'm like, yep, cool. I'm going to apply for some residencies. And I remember speaking to Andrew Holloway at Animal Health Trust. I went to visit there. And he just flat out told me, and this, I hated at the time, but it was probably some of the most helpful advice at the time. He said, you're never going to get a residency. And I was like, oh, like, that's pretty confronting. I came here to visit. And he's like, just think about this logically. You're an equine practitioner with no small animal experience. Most, if not all the radiology programs are 90% small animal. And we have 70 applicants every year. And they've all done clinical experience and a small animal internship. And they were top of their class. They're just like, he's just like, the odds are against it. I'm, I'm really sorry. And that was incredibly painful to hear, but also incredibly helpful because I knew that I had to do something different. And at the same time, I kind of lost a little bit of my enthusiasm for realizing how hard this was going to work. And, and I had the, um, the, the metaphoric kick up the backside by my wife who said, you know, I think I came home and I was just doing locum work and I just wasn't really, this is in the UK, we were living at Cambridge at the time. You know, I was kind of lumping on the couch between locum jobs. She says, what are we doing here? Let's go back home or you get a residency. And, so, and that was kind of it. And I actually heard something similar at the RVC. Um, Paul Mahoney said the same thing. He's just like, right now there's, again, 70 applicants for the radiology residency. Most of them, are doing an internship. So you're going to need an internship and it has to be a small animal internship. And I'm like, okay, great. Equine vet going back to small animal. I'll just apply for the RVC internship. And he said, you're not going to get that either. Like there's 120 <laughs> applicants from all around the world who are top of their class. And you know, they might have some small animal experience that so you're not going to get it. And I'm like, Oh Jesus. So this is this, This montage is getting harder by the <laughs> by each visit I go to. So at the time, I was looking for internships, and you know, there's referral hospitals setting up. And one of the referral hospitals, which is Southern County's vet specialist in Ringwood, they didn't have a start date. They're like, we we need to advertise, but we're not sure when we're going to start. And I said, guys, I don't care when you start. Just call me, and I'll be there because I'm doing local work. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And that was helpful for them because they didn't have to plan a, an intern, but also all the other interns couldn't wait that long. I was one of the only interns at the start and they called me one day saying, Hey, we're, we're opening up on Monday. I'm like, cool, I'll be there. And I became a small animal intern with no small animal experience at all. I was picking up 18, 16 gauge needles for a tiny little cat. <laughs> like it was just, uh, it, it, it was a bit comical, but the nurses, at SCBS were really amazing and they also made fun of me a lot. I can just see Steve trotting a cat in the backyard, lunging it to see where the lameness is. <laughs> Trot it up. Trot it up. And it, it was neat. And during that time, they were setting up their imaging workflow and their, their packs, how they manage all their medical imaging. And they also had the MRI truck show up once a week. They had a CT scanner that they, they bought. They didn't know how to use. So I spent my evenings, you know, scanning my iPhone or a microphone or my lunch and just working out how to use the CT scanner. And that was about the time I think Vicky came back to do some training and, and she saw what we were doing there. And, you know, after a year of that internship, I used that experience and Vicky's 
recommendation and, and started applying to radiology residencies. Okay. And then the ironic thing there is the one place I had never visited was the only place that gave me the job. <laughs> That's because I hadn't met you yet then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Like, think which so. was, where did you go? Where did you do your residency? It was the uh, University of Glasgow. Glasgow, okay. And then, yeah, once I was in the residency, you know, you, you're kind of, you're over that next threshold. And, you know, mm. you work hard, you'll get the diploma, which wasn't instant, but um, but yeah. That, that was that stage. I'm going to circle back to a sentence that you said before. That was painful, but it was helpful because it made me realize that I had to do something different. Mm. I like that a lot. I think maybe that's where my journey changed because it was a lot of people get stuck with, oh, that's really painful. I'm going to step away from that pain and do something else because I don't like that feeling. <laughs> What what was that something different to when you, you guys decided I've got to chase a residency, but I th- kind of I thought you were kind of chasing them already. What did you do differently yeah. to, to to pursue it harder? I think I think what ended up working was finding that internship because okay. all I needed was an internship, right? Okay, all right. and the I had to be a little bit more creative and flexible to get that internship. Okay, so instead of sitting around moping, going, "Oh fuck, I can't find a residency. This sucks." Life is against me going, well, yeah. this isn't going to work. If I really want this, find the, find the door. Yep. Yeah, yep, exactly. Glasgow. So that was three years in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. And that was obviously an amazing time. I think Glasgow became our second home. Like we would happily live in Glasgow or Perth in Australia, like two opposite ends of really every spectrum. But ultimately I, I, I didn't pass the board exams the first time mm. and I was very jaded and, you know, see it's everybody else's fault, but mine. And not that that's true. It's just like at the time, very, very pissed off. And then my first job as a radiologist was at university of Illinois. I took that obviously as an unboarded residency trained uh, radiologist. And when I got to Illinois, that was a, an absolute eye opening in terms of the quality, I guess that how busy that hospital in the middle of nowhere is and the training program itself and the, the caliber of the residents leading up through the years. It was just, I learned so much from my senior resident who I'm supposed to be supervising. Um, I learned more from them than I did in my entire residency. And ultimately, wow. you know, with the help of my boss as well, I went back and rewrote the next year and I felt like it was a totally different story. It was an easy exam comparatively. I, I felt confident and I knew the process and um, yeah, very grateful for that time in, in Illinois. Two minute interruption to plug our clinical podcasts. Steve talks here about being in an environment where he was surrounded by smart, talented, enthusiastic people and how that made something that was impossible before almost effortless. This reminds me of a truism that I like. You are the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. The problem is that when it comes to your vet work, unless you work in a large vet institute, you don't get much say in this. So what we try to do with our clinical podcast series is to give you the opportunity to spend a bit of time, three times, 20 minutes every week to be more exact, with some of the smartest and most enthusiastic vets you could possibly hope to find. And I want to guarantee that by hanging out with our guest specialists every week, that those smarts will rub off on you. It's almost like a diffusion gradient where high levels of information permeates through your eardrums into an area of low information. Not saying that your brain is an area of low information or anything, but you get what I'm saying. And then, before you know it, those hard things become almost easy, as Steve puts it. And when work is easy, work is fun. And when work is fun, you're happier. Try it for free for two weeks at vvn.supercast.com. All right, left turn. So you're a specialist, you qualify as a specialist, you get job as a specialist radiologist, you live the dream life in Fremantle, knocking off at four in the afternoon and going to the beach, and then you decide to throw it all away. What for and why? Yeah, it was... All right, so a few things came together at the same time. I was 
obviously enjoying the work, but I wasn't necessarily enjoying the job. And really, it, you know, the company I was working for had this office in WA, but we were incredibly busy. There was so many cases to look at. But when I was hired, part of my role was to be doing uh, extra sort of reporting activities, you know, liaising with research studies from universities, um, almost being sort of a customer success and R and D outreach sort of role as well, and really to build the business case. But we were so busy that there was a lot of pressures to keep reporting, and I was kind of being pulled between the global office and the Australian office, and that just it really started to weigh down on me, and um, I burned out. And I remember having a little bit of a I think a nervous breakdown or a, not a nervous breakdown, a uh, anxiety attack. Mm-hmm. And, and that was really reflecting my subconscious feeling towards that work environment. And I took a bunch of time off. And at the same time, over the those sort of few years, I was really thinking about some of these issues that we have in veterinary medicine and human medicine, to, to be honest, just around medical data. And I, felt that there's a lot of things that frustrated me and the work that I did as a radiologist and all my friends as vets. And I was just like, why is this not being solved? And we looked at going digital. I mean, you were probably working when clinics were transitioning from sort of paper folder records in big file cabinets. I want to be offended by that comment, but yes, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I was too. Like I was too. There's still a lot of clinics that were paper based at the time. And and you know, a very organized cabinet system with all those different color numbers on the files. Like that was a bit of a pride into how organized these clinics were. And that we were promised that the world going digital and practice software was gonna solve all these problems. Things would connect, information would be there, systems would be efficient and automated. And, you know, 20 years later, I'm still looking at the, you know, the University of Glasgow's admin department and they're crunching through printed pieces of paper and faxes and typing out forms onto some other computer. And I just thought this is crazy. And then working in radiology, I get sent an an x-ray of a dog from London and they sent it yesterday, but it's on my list to report the next day. And I'm looking at it. And then the history pops up next to it. There's a PDF and I'm looking at it. It's like, wait a second. The history says this is a cat, but what I'm looking at is very much a dog. And I'm like, they have the same name. They're from the same clinic. You know, they were seen roughly about the same time. And I was like, how is this happening that I'm looking at the wrong history for this patient? And it's kind of getting contrasted at the same time with the medical imaging. So that x-ray pops up. It's a DICOM file. I can see exactly what time, which clinic, which firmware on the x-ray machine is being used to create that image. Like I can see all this metadata that tells me so much about that imaging study, even like the the KV and MAS settings sometimes. I can see that from from Perth. And at at the same time, I'm looking at the wrong history for the patient. I just thought, how are these two worlds coexisting? And why is the medical data not perfect? Like, why can I not see exactly where that animal was before all of its previous imaging studies? But like, why is this not possible? Technically, it probably is possible. But why are we not there? And I started thinking about a few solutions, especially some tech that has come on the scenes the last couple of years. And I thought there's probably a better way to do this. Let me take that quick um, neighbors montage moment and build a new system. <laughs> and uh, and at the time, so so obviously I'm, I'm quite stressed with the, the job that hasn't turned into what I wanted it to be. And I'm seeing this problem and seeing some solutions that aren't being utilized. And I thought, you know what, I probably should look at this. And, and my wife said, there's a, it's a startup weekend competition here in Perth. And it's like, why don't you go and pitch the idea and, and, and enter the competition? And so that was can, super. Can daunting. I just say that your wife sounds amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she yeah. keeps pushing the right buttons at the right time. <laughs> no, she does. She does. And she probably can hear me talking about her now, but no, she's amazing. And, you know, exactly right. Pushing at the right time and took a bit of a, a leap of faith and, 
ended up finding some interesting people to join my startup team on that weekend. And we, we won that startup competition. So hang on, I want to recap some of the stories. Interesting sentence again. Uh, I, I was enjoying the work, but I wasn't enjoying the job. I, yeah. I, I feel like that's a common thing. I think I feel like there's a lot of people who go, I actually don't like being a vet, but it's not necessarily the, the work. It's the, job do you agree yeah yeah and that was pretty relevant to the the work-related stress that i experienced and speaking to a clin psych afterwards especially as i had that sort of work-related stress event they explained to me is that something in my body and my physiology is not happy with that work environment and it goes in different scales so you can feel this stress just in that office doing the job that you love and to fix it you just move to another office or you get away from the stress it might be a person it might be a you know like cats it might be the construction across the street um most of the time it's probably a you know a personality difference with somebody else but uh, then if you don't catch it in time the work-related stress sort of starts to engulf the job with that company and then if you don't catch it in time again, it starts to involve and engulf the job that you do regardless of the company. And then eventually mm-hmm. it'll engulf the, the industry that you're in. So I caught it at a stage of, you know, this is not a right fit for me within this job, in this environment. But today I can still read cases and I love it. So like, I love the actual work. I just, I, I did catch it in time. That's really fascinating. So one component of unpleasant emotions, strong unpleasant emotions tied with one thing within a situation can start spilling over and tainting everything that your mind associates yeah. with that environment. Yeah. So I had like a anxiety attack walking to the office and it was my, you know, I just didn't want to be in that office. And it was very hard to explain at the time. And i would always heard about people with work-related stress before. And I just thought, you know, in in my naive mind, and I was just like, come on, harden up. Like it's, you know, go for a walk, like all this sort of stupid shit that probably, probably boomers say, but I think experiencing it really opened my mind and there was nothing I could do to make that journey any easier or exist in that office. And i I remember going to see a doc right away because I thought I was, you know, I thought I was having a heart attack. And when they said, this is work-related stress, you got two weeks off, mate. I'm signing you off for two weeks. And the nice thing about that is that it instantly lifted. Like, as in, I felt instantly better knowing I don't have to go back to that office for, for two weeks was almost a perfect example of that. That is the problem. And we got rid of the problem and now you feel better. And it made me think a little bit at the time, what do I, what do I need to change here? Like, do I need a different office, different company, different job? And that, that was sort of what was playing up in my head. But at the same time, I I took a plunge with this startup idea. So it was literally just in that, in that two week period that you started hatching this. It was the Saturday after that Thursday, I think it was two days later. Well, you started thinking, Hey, this, wow, isn't it incredible? Your mind just needs a bit of breathing space. Yeah. I was thinking about a lot of the solution to a problem that I know everybody experiences. And it was just that the timing worked out well and forced me really to think about a lot of aspects. Like this, this startup competition forces you to think about business and business plans and market dynamics and business models. It's just, it was really neat to experience and totally foreign, but it was enough of a mental break as well. And I came back from that two weeks and said, I don't think this is right for me. I'm going to resign and take some time off. And during that time off, I was going to focus on this. So that was, um, it was just, it was amazing sort of coincidence of timing, especially with the fact that, you know, they haven't run one of those weekends in Perth for a while. So it happened to be the one year that I was, walking on my way to work, having a panic attack. Wow. Let's talk about your, the problem that you're trying to solve. So it's mm. a data management problem. And it's, it's when you were describing that feeling that you got with 
this excellent technology, but it's not quite there. It, it's such a strong emotion for me because I, I get that so often with so much tech. You go, this is supposed to be so good, but there's yeah. just, just something missing yeah. and it infuriates me. And I want to, you almost want to say, well, I just want a freaking card system because it's not going to crash. It's not going <laughs> to hang. Back. It's not going to, because it, it actually worked better. Yeah. It actually caused me less stress. There. So, because technology is amazing, but when it's not working, it's freaking stress. It's not working for sure. Yeah. Or the promises that were given the, the way something is going to work and it doesn't. So yeah, the, the problem that we're solving is all around veterinary medical data. And it's interesting because everybody knows how bad it is. You can, they all say a bunch of things and everybody I think here will agree. It's just that nobody has time to really sit down and assess it. Nobody has time to acknowledge it. And instead with the way that the veterinary world is, you know, nurses and vets and receptionists and, you know, admin people, we're so busy that we don't have time to go, I wonder if there's a better way. I wonder <laughs> if we can do something. It's like, no. I, I wasn't going to disagree with you. Could you say everybody, veterinary data, everybody uh, knows it's so bad. And I want to disagree and go, I don't know that we do because we just, you're used to it being this way and that's the way it you're is. Used to so, it. So, yeah. so why, what, yeah. give me examples. Okay, so you've, you've given the example of, a radiologist who gets reports. That's not most of us. So in mm -hmm. everyday veterinary life, why is it bad? What's bad or what could it look like? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we'll go through some examples. Uh, in an emergency clinic, the animal arrives. It's a six-year-old dog, and you have no information whatsoever on that animal except from what you can get from the frantic owner. So, which is always amazing. It is amazing. Is it on any medications? Yeah, yeah, is it some tablets Something, for? I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's pink. Uh, I think it's yeah. for his incontinence, but maybe it's for it's his round. heart. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Okay, that helps. That helps a lot. <laughs> and, and you know, like these animals were seen by their vet two hours before that. They had blood tests. They had everything, but it's just not available. And so that's one example. And even if it is available, say that they do have access to the history, or it's printed out, or maybe they have it, it's full of mistakes as well because like you know we are human and we're typing in information and we're typing it in with errors i'll just skip forward a little bit when we look at a practice and their the medical data 60 percent of the medical records have mistakes even in what the patient identifies so if the husband brings in a cat in say march the wife brings it in in april there's two different records for that animal because it came in with two different people. And now we have this splitting of medical it's probably data. spelled differently. It's spelled differently. <laughs> yep. Or they put in the microchip one, one year and they forgot one of those zeros. Uh, we have like a story of the, the husband brings it in for vaccination in March. The wife brings it in, in, in August and the vet goes, this, this cat hasn't been vaccinated in like four years. And she's like, I tell the bloody husband every time he goes to the vet clinic, every time, and he always forgets. <laughs> poor the poor cat's been vaccinated eight times in two years, right? <laughs> so, and he's doing his job, but he can't remember. He's like, I swear, to God, they got vaccinated. So it's just stuff like that, and or like you look at how many times you're filling out forms or calling hospitals for like, hey, we've just got Fluffy here that's moved from I don't know Adelaide. Can you send the history? They're busy because they've got a normal job to do. It's just when you think about what you're asking for and what is available are two different things, but we don't have time to think about it. It's the status quo of this archaic, it's an archaic way. We have lots of different software that doesn't talk. And if it does, it doesn't map very well. I think if you look back and say, you know what, we should probably redesign this better. That That's sort of the approach I took. And, and I thought, you know, I didn't think it was going to be easy or, or simple, but it's definitely a better way to do this. And that's sort of where we've come to with what we created with, with Vetti and obviously what we're solving. So to, to boil it down very simply, we figured out a way to lock the patient's medical data to its existing microchip. So the microchip that's always there, uh, American listeners might you know, they deal with microchips all the time, but it's just not as prevalent in the US. But in the UK and most of Europe and Australia, it's a mandatory requirement for cats and dogs to have a microchip. So we thought if we could tie all the medical data to that microchip, wherever that animal goes, scanning that microchip would open up 
access to this information. But we're kind of left with another problem there. It's like, cool, you could put a million different pieces of information in there that it doesn't really matter to the end user unless they can trust implicitly that that information is correct. Because if it's wrong and full of these mistakes and these duplicates and the wrong patient got the wrong blood results, then they're left at the start again and they have to repeat everything. And now they've gone through all this process and it's not been helpful. So the other part of what we do is make sure that every piece of data getting associated to that microchip and locked to that patient is not only true and accurate, but verifiable by the person downstream. And what I mean by that is that the person that's dealing with that information when they scan that microchip can see exactly when that data was made by who and allows them the confidence to move on. So the example of that would be the Hendra virus in Australia. So I'm sure most listeners know about Hendra virus, especially you where you are. It is a viral disease that goes from bats to horses and then horses, uh, humans can catch it from horses. And can die. Yeah, so 50% mortality rate, right? So when we're talking about trust and integrity in vaccine certificates, nothing's more important than a 50% mortality rate. Now, right now, before us, the way that the vets would certify this is that they would write down that microchip number. And because they're human, there's mistakes. That would go onto a registry. And sometimes it's CSV uploads of horses from a paddock. Nobody knows that two horses left three days ago and they weren't vaccinated. And two more came during that time, but they haven't been updated on the list. But the registry says that they're vaccinated. And so I think for something that's got such a massive biosecurity and zoonotic risk, that's not a great state. And that's just the far extreme. So we came in and said, hey, the vet scanned this microchip and we have absolute proof that it was done here in the hinterland of the Gold Coast at this time, at this place, and this microchip scan. But they also scanned the vaccine vial and there's a GPS location with that image and a time-stamped event with the cert that the vet has done on their device at that time location. And then we also use nerdy tech, and I don't want to get too nerdy because it is, but we also use a blockchain timestamp. And what that does is it says that this information in terms of this horse was here at this time with this vaccine vial and this vet, it gets packaged up and locked at that time. So when somebody else two years later or one year later scans that microchip, they know with absolute mathematical certainty that their friend, the vet, was there two years ago vaccinating that animal. And so, you know, we, we've got images of grotty thumbnails holding a Hendra vaccine with a GPS location. And so it, it just provides automated certainty of an event happening. And none of that required somebody to enter a microchip number or write sort of a piece of paper. All they had to do is scan the microchip and scan the vaccine vial. We did the rest. That means that now we have oversight into a vaccinated population, or we can see which batch numbers are going to which animals. There's so much more that's activated when you have clean, verifiable, automated data. It almost changes the world. And that's sort of the, the, the thought process behind what we're doing. And I don't want to get too into the woods about that, but we apply that to everything else we do in the small animal clinic. We'll save the vet's time because it's removing the human entry and the errors associated with that. But we're giving the downstream vets or owners something that they don't need to question. It automatically plugs into their system. So I guess clinical pathology is another one. The vets scan the microchip and they scan a blood tube with a barcode on it. We marry the two. All they have to do is choose the test. And now there's traceability of that blood tube to the lab. It's compatible with the sushi trains of analyzers at the lab and the results come back. We timestamp those. So it's just like everything's automated and we know everything about that animal from a scan of a microchip, you know, who owns the animal, what sort of breed, age, everything there. We know the vet that it came from. We're not going to ask them to fill out a form. We know all that information on the form. So we just say, hey, what test do you want to do? And give us some history if you want. But now we're going to track the sample which belongs to this exact animal and the lab has all the data they need. And then the results come back. We lock that to the microchip as well. So that if that animal goes to the emergency center at three in the morning, scanning that microchip will show the last blood results or the last 10. And all of it was done instantly without all this data entry. 
that hits me in a, in a good spot there. Uh, like it makes me very happy because that, what you say there, we already have all that data. I often, especially with us, with human stuff, with um, you know, government things or tax or hospitals or things like that, and you fill in the same information every oh, time. God, yeah. And I'm like, but you already know this. I guarantee you that if yep. I commit a crime, you're going to find that information in about three seconds. But, but now you put the onus on me to provide it again and again and again. Uh, so, so this basically says, yeah, we know that. We know these things yeah. about you and everything, and, and, we, and everything new we learn about you, we're going to keep it in one place so that next time somebody wants to know it, they can scan your microchip and go, yep, here's what we know. Let me add some more data to it. And there's an aspect there is like, we're not just passing this information out willy nilly. We're basically saying, prove to us that you're a vet. And when you scan this information, the previous vets want you to have this. So, you know, we're not saying go to the dog park and scan all these dogs and get their owner's details and give them 50% off. Like, no, they have to, one, prove that they are the attending vet and the vet that manages that owner. But at the same time, we're going to tell anybody, hey, this animal is vaccinated for rabies or canine influenza or Hendra. Like, that's information that every vet wants every other vet to know or any animal health worker. So that's, yeah, and going back to your question about, like, do the vets know this? I think the vets know the problem because exactly right. Like they are frustrated writing out something again that they know is saved on their practice software or, and like, if you think about it, it's like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, there's some amazing practice software out there. They handle a lot of things, but the service providers still want you to fill out a form. They still want you to like, and the reason they do that is that the service providers can't trust the data that comes from the practice software. It's full of mistakes they don't know when it is a mistake or not. So they say, you know what, screw that. Let the vet fill it out again properly. And that way we can ignore the burden of data integrity back on the vet before they submit this form. Otherwise, it would just be chaos. So we, we kind of found that perfect balance there of we know everything about this animal, this vet, and this owner from the start. Let's not ask the vet for the same questions again. Let's just plug them into the next service that wants to use that provable, verifiable data. And that's, it's like, it almost in hindsight, a lot of people saying, this is why, why wasn't this done at the start? And, you know, practice software in the vet world, practice software became both the health record and the billing and the scheduling mm -hmm. and the appointments and the stock and everything. And now they're starting to realize that that animal goes between different services all the time. Either it's data does, or it actually visits a referral, an emergency, the GP hospital down south on holiday, or it moves to Adelaide. Like the health kennels. record truly so, does kennels. Yep. There's a lot of people that need to see that, that health data, but the practice software Holds on to it. locks it up in just yeah. that service. And they're not doing this maliciously. It's just, they offered a service of how to do clinical notes, but we, what we're offering is a universal health record that allows that to go with the animal and go with where the vets want that data to go. That's where we come in. We're not becoming a practice software at all. We're just becoming that health record that's going to bridge between all gotcha. of them. Um, one thing I just need to point out, and I, I know this, and that's why I think it's important to mention. So it's not, it's not like you have some magical special microchip that receives all the information and stores the information on the microchip, right? It's not what's your normal everyday microchip. It's not the Vidi microchip yeah. that that is very special. No, no. <laughs> no it, it, it definitely wouldn't work if we had to reintroduce a new microchip. So no, it's the existing microchips that are there. And what we do here is that we use it as a lock and key. If that animal is there and the vet scans it, proving to us that the animal is there, like they can't type this number and they have to scan it that unlocks the world of which that animal's data is stored. I guess the way to explain this, they've unlocked access to that animal's data that might be stored in the cloud. And they've done so by scanning that microchip. And then obviously the ability to add information to it gets locked again when the animal leaves. And just having that time stamped verification, they can say, whoa, I can see exactly when that PDF was made. So Think about the rabies certificates in the UK or in Australia. Right now, you have a vet that nobody knows doing a vaccine certificate for rabies. And they scribble their signature and when it's due next and put that sticker that's already smudging on the card. And they say to the owner, keep this with the dog. And we've got the microchip sticker in there too, so they'll look at that. 
Then it goes to like sort of a district government vet who gives it a stamp of approval. And then it goes to the exporting vet and maybe the, the logistics vet, big stamp, checking the documents. And then it arrives on the doorstep into Australia or the UK. And that's the first time that they know about this happening. And they have to trust the integrity of the first vet clinic. Or so the first vet and the district vets that they've signed and checked all these details that it's actually happened. What we're saying is that let's put the importing authority or the you know the people that need to see that this animal is vaccinated, let's put them into the consult room at the start. We're going to show them the image that was used, the proof of the microchip scan. So we know the animal was there and we know the vet that was there because they're using the app to scan all this information. And we time stamped it so that this couldn't occur at any other time. And we showing the, the certificate as a digital timestamp as well, so that when they see it, when it arrives in Australia or in the UK, they know that it's not a forged document. It's, you know, it's true and verifiable back to that date. I just want to encapsulate it one more time, just to, under- to make sure I understand what this does. So tell me if this picture that I've got in my head. So all the patient data, you said data or data? Uh, I go data, but I've got the Canadian accent, so I, I, I prefer data. It's just like I sound like I'm fake when I say that. Do, do you say Vedi or Vedi? It's, it's Vedi, but it started in terms of its name idea came from sort of the Jedi, the Force, the Force being everywhere. <laughs> I thought Vedi, but everybody sort of changed it to Vedi because it sounded more Medi. I like Vedi. I love that, the Force. So basically the data is in the force, in the ether, in the cloud. It's there available at access points where anybody might want access to that patient's data. So that's at the vet clinic, at the emergency clinic, at the kennels, at the state vet that needs to verify anything. But I can't get it until the key comes into physical proximity to me and the key lives under the skin of that animal in the form of a 16-digit code. And the animal comes and it says... Scan it yeah. with your magical scanner. Now the doors open and I can see what's there and I can add to it. And then we're done. The doors shut. And is that right? That's almost 100%. I'd say that there's still aspects of the animal's data that will travel without the animal. So like medical images will go without the animal and you know results and certificates. But that's the premise is that to be able to access and add and work, interact with this high quality medical record that you have to prove the animals there and that affords all these automations. Yeah. And obviously we're not complete with the medical history yet. We're building strategically and, and logically. Like we started with the vaccination certificate because that was the point of entry that we thought we could deliver. And we looked at insurance claim forms or council registrations, but there's a 53% chance that the animal walks into that GP clinic for vaccination or vaccinations can be done during that consult. And the owners were leaving with a paper certificate that, you know, by the time they walked out the door, they've lost it. And then they're calling at Christmas saying, Hey, can I have a certificate? I'm going to the kennels or, and so we just said, you know, let's lock that to the microchip. If it goes to the kennels, they can scan the microchip and see it. And we solved something instantly for the owner. And we also solved something for the front of house staff, the receptionist. We've solved it for the vet. And we had to say, all right, so they like it. Let's just make sure that this is super instant. So the vets, all they have to do is scan the vaccine vial and we'll, we'll pull everything else up. That was the first step. And once we were in with vaccinations, and that was a paperless version of this, you know, we still have email certificates, but still this is far more valuable and stays with the animal for life. But very quickly, we had to build upon this. And so the next logical place for us to go was clinical pathology with reference labs. And so we built that system. And now we're on to our fourth or fifth system that's in development now. So we're, you know, emergency check-in and access and referral triaging. So, you know, the vet wants to send this for a referral instead of filling out web forms for five different referral hospitals. We can automate all that, right? So... We have an end of life module, which works with the crematorium here. So we have the largest death registry. I mean, how many times has a receptionist fielded a phone call from a, an owner that said, you've sent me a vaccine reminder for my animal that you put to sleep last week. And it's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's, like, it's horrible, but it happens. And it happens because 
information is not being available or being used properly. And it's a tedious process to keep on top of this. So if we see that animal is deceased, we will broadcast that out to all the clinics that have scanned it before saying, Hey, Mrs. Johnson's just lost her dog. Don't send her a vaccine reminder, you know, set her up as a deceased animal. That's the sort of aim we're going in. We're building upon that all the time. We started this conversation with a reference to, to KY, to lube. So you, you kind of the so, so Vid is kind of the the KY for for moving data around, right? <laughs> Makes accessing data frictionless and pain free. <laughs> yeah, I think the what I've learned is that business stuff that we're never taught at vet school is incredibly hard. And my good idea is that I think you know, coming from an academic background, I, you know, I publish a paper, it's got a p value of whatever. Therefore, the rest of the radiologists start doing this thing and it sort of permeates through how we teach residents. That doesn't happen in business. I'm like, hey, I got this thing that saves us time and does all this. Everyone's like, cool. And you expect everybody to applaud and go, thank God we've been waiting for it. Here we go. Take our money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely doesn't work like that. <laughs> oh, so what else? What else have you learned? Because that's a hell of a long way from reading x-rays. It's been a journey. Let's make it applicable for a veterinary audience. Eh? What have you learned in this journey that let's say you get sick of this or it doesn't work or something and you have to go back to GP vet practice? What have you learned over the last five myself, years? Myself as GP. He has to go back to working as a vet. I feel bad for all the uh, the nurses and the animals that have to be subjected <laughs> to that. Um, I think I, I've really enjoyed not knowing a solution and trying to figure it out and trying to, you know, it's, it's a challenge for us because we're the first to do what we're claiming and trying to do here. But that just means that we have to f forge our own path. I guess we come up with issues all the time and the team and myself, we, we actually really enjoy trying to figure out and spending our time going down rabbit holes with some tech that might be fruitful at the end, might not. I think that has been fun. It's almost like puzzle solving. I guess it's like working up a case. You don't know what the answer is going to be. Um, what else have I learned? I've kind of learned that um, to accept no and even criticism, like a lot of people have said what we're doing is crazy or critiquing and giving negative feedback and why they don't want to use it or why they've stopped using it. Like that, that really hurt at the start, but now I love it. I love the negative feedback. I love the annoyance of something that's not working because at least I'm hearing about it and I'm hearing about it. Therefore it gets fixed and we can address it. And that was a learning for me. Like, you know, the criticism before this, I didn't handle very well. So how did you make that shift? Because uh, again, I'm trying to apply this to, to my life and our listeners' lives. So the complaint or the case that doesn't go well, how, how do you make that shift from take, taking it personally to going, oh, well, maybe there's something to that. Um, how, what can I do differently? Yeah, it's it's a little bit, maybe there's some similarities there, but it's different because it's business. Like the, the, the group is just saying, we don't get this or we don't want to use this or it didn't work. And it, for me, it was almost like a, a, an attack on my life and passion putting into this business or this technology and you know, my business partner, Ross, is very good. He's like, they just gave you free criticism or free advice or free things that you can solve. That is super valuable. They're telling you why it's not working. So let's make it work. And that was it. But I guess going back to the bad cases that have happened and, you know, I've definitely been involved with something where I was completely wrong and maybe had a negative outcome with that patient. That's tough. And I think really what made that manageable is that we were doing our absolute best at the time with information at hand and that information at hand might be somewhat inexperienced information like maybe I, i've had a wrong call or still do but that's all i had at the time and, and as long as i'm not being malicious or irresponsible and i'm trying my best and i'm documenting how well i'm trying then it's it, it feels horrible when it happens but that's part of, I guess, being a vet 
And, you know, if you get pulled up in front of the board, but you've done everything you can to document why you've made a decision and what brought you there, then you've done everything that you can. They're not going to find you at fault. The other side to it as well is I've been part of institutions that have had put pride into their morbidity and mortality rounds. And I think, I don't know how often I've seen that in general practice, but it basically is a chance for someone to say, this case screwed up. I was involved with it. This is why I did that. And I'm opening it up to the floor to tell me where I went wrong. And people that aren't part of that case get to hear and learn. And people that are part of the case get to learn as well. And the experienced vets get to say, this is what I think's happened. This is how you can learn. And that is really tough because I remember you're standing up presenting to your peers who, you know, at this stage, you're like, Hey, everybody, look at my fuck ups. <laughs> and also, because like everybody is high achievers and they've never failed an exam before in their lives. Like they're, they're looked at by the students as these amazing people that are following a training path. And all of a sudden you're sitting up there going, I screwed up and I'm telling the world and, or I have to tell the world because it's my week to do M&M rounds. That was amazing. And I think if there's, if there are general practice hospitals that do that, I think that would be really neat to see. I worry that some of these cases are sort of swept under the rug with the owner and, you know, apologies, but nobody wants to talk about it. It's funny here because we, I have often thought this and it's happened to me. And at the time you think you appreciate it, but when something goes wrong and you approach colleagues, supportive colleagues and friends within the, in the vet community about it and saying, ah, oh, I had this case, I did this and this. And often the response is, oh, look, don't worry about it. You did great. You're trying your best, which is lovely. You need that support. But then it's left at that instead of saying, but let's look at what you did. Like often it'll be like, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And then we all go, all right, my friends all said I'm off the hook. And let's move on to the next thing. And then you don't learn from it. Whereas if you say, no, no, I'm not asking for a reassurance that I'm not a bad person. I know I'm not a bad person. But in this instant, I wasn't the best at my job that I could be. Why not? Let's look at why not, because I don't want to do the same next time. Yeah. I remember the other side to that as well as the humility and honesty from the people that are passing their constructive criticism or their constructive judgment. That is super important because a lot of the time it might be the young vets that are eager to learn how they can be better, but maybe the older vets don't have too much pride to acknowledge when they are wrong. And so the M&M rounds that I think worked in back in Glasgow, I remember the anesthetist was the first one to go. And I think he was highlighting a case that, you know, this God of anesthesia screwed up and, you know, wasn't as simple as that, but it was just enough to see that like, you know, we're all human and they've taken the first step to kind of show where something's gone wrong and where they went wrong and what they've done and learned since then. And that, that opened up the door, I think for some really interesting honesty. And it's one of my pet peeves is, you know, eminence based medicine and evidence based medicine. It's like, I remember a case and it was being worked up a few different times and the history was suggesting an ectopic ureter. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, I don't see this as ectopic. It didn't fit with an ectopic ureter. And the suggestions that came back when I ran it up the flagpole was just not definitely a topic because this person said it was, and ah. they're the eminent specialist on this. And I, I was so frustrated because I'd come up with these reasons why I don't think it was, and it was just batted down as no, he's the expert. So we go with the expert. And that's, that was a little bit disheartening, I think. Um, so I love obviously the honesty that comes with that. There's, there's an interesting, uh, not to plug somebody else's podcast, but uh, Toby Trimble's got a, a podcast interviewing, I think I think her last name is Milne, where she talks about eminence and evidence-based medicine in practice. And that's a really good, besides all the Vet Vault podcasts, which are why we're here and phenomenal, that's another very interesting one on evidence-based practice. Cool. I'll have a listen. I <laughs> you can like cut it. that bit out. <laughs> no, I, no, no, not at all. I love it. So no mention. <laughs> <laughs> of course you get a mention. This is what we're here for. We're here to learn not to grow the faith vault, dude. Uh, hey, <laughs> I, I want to ask you, have we got time? How's your time going? Oh, I've got, I've got loads of time. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So you're into tech. Um, you're obviously, for your business, you have to keep your finger on the pulse of what's new and what's happening and 
pet related tech. Is there anything else out there that excites you or that you're into or that you're curious about? Yeah, I guess the, the vet specific stuff, and it's probably a lot on a lot of people's minds is AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning. Mm. I, I really love that aspect and I'm involved with the education and awareness piece with the European college and the American college, sort of introducing best practice and caveats to AI. Let's talk about AI. I see there's a lot of chat, uh-huh. chat, chat GPT, uh, the, the AI, oh, yeah. um, what do you call it? that you can write, that you could give a prompt and it writes something. And I've actually seen on some of the vet social media chatter that some people are actually using it for vet histories to help them write histories and Mm -hmm. stuff. Have you found utility for it? So let's quick, quick rundown for anybody who hasn't come across it yet. Give us a quick rundown of what the stuff is. Do I start broader or jump into the chat GPT? Uh, Let's start broad. Yeah, sure. So the easy thing here is that AI machine learning is just statistics and I'll give it's statistics and rehashing an algorithm based on an outcome that happened before. And that's training. So if you're training something to recognize a cow in a paddock, if you give it one picture, it's not going to know how to look at that cow when it's head on. And so you got to train it with lots of information and tell it, this is a cow, this is a cow, this This is a cow, cow. this is not a cow. Yeah. And that's sort of it. It's statistics and modeling and classifiers that are getting better with more and more information. The information, if you're giving it poor lead standard information, then it's going to learn off of that. So the information that you use to train AI has to be absolute gold standard, what you can at the time. So if we fast forward, chat GPT has come out where they have trained this language model based off of a of tons and tons of data on the internet in terms of how people are speaking, how things are being written. Um, You know, they have the full works of Shakespeare. They have all the lyrics, every song. They have all the encyclopedias, the PhD papers that might be publicly available. They have everything. And they've trained this language model to respond in a way that feels like you're talking to a person on a chat page. And, so if you ask it saying, listen, can you write me the lyrics of my favorite song, which is, I don't know, it's called Team Spirit by Nirvana, but do it in the style of Shakespeare. It will rehash that entire thing in the style of Shakespeare and it will be a brilliantly accurate in terms of like, you'll be wow, blown away. If you ask the English professor in Oxford about this, the standard of that Shakespearean poem, they would be horrified. And they might say, this is lazy, this is crap. But for what it's doing is pretty amazing. Can I quickly just what what was your favorite Nirvana song? Did you say? Because I want to do that exercise. Oh, that like, you said. Smell, <laughs> smells like Team Spirit. It smells like Team Spirit Nirvana. Verily, I bring a song of youthful disdain, of rebellion against the ways of olden gain, a battle cry, a call to arms in spirit form against the dullness that doth our youth deform. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm going. laughs> and I think skipping forward to loading up some. I don't know, biochemistry and hematology results and some clinical signs into chat GBT and saying, give me a list of differentials. It will do an amazing job, but you won't know when it's screwed up. And I tested this the other day. I wrote in my radiology report and just said, I'm interested to see what the differentials it would come from here. And it got a couple. It suggested one I hadn't thought of, but I'm still not sure if that's applicable, but it got some completely wrong. And I think what it's done there is it's made an association between a common disease and a common imaging feature, but it hasn't recognized that I might have the opposite imaging feature or or whatever. And it's grouped those associations and put it into a nice spit out of text. And to the untrained eye, you would potentially copy and paste that into a report. And that would be absolutely detrimental. So I, I would say that it's useful for bulking up some processes and some text, but it does need some critical thinking and assessment before you use that to anything. And, and I would, you know, I'd very much be interested in what some medics and oncologists say with some of this stuff as well, just because I reckon they would see major flaws in it. Doesn't mean that it will be perfect in 10 years time. It might be absolutely perfect, but right now it's a mashup of language that it thinks is appropriate for what your clinical case is in front of you. The way we're using it 
in our business is a lot less riskier. So we have a new web page or a new app interface that comes up and we need a style guide adapted for that page. And instead of going through line by line, we ask chat GPT to rehash the style guide for this page and it'll do 99% of it and it might screw up four bits, but you get to fix four bits and you get to see it, and well, load it. And explain and what it. you mean by style guide, like what, what sort of prompt? So the developers will make a app interface do a certain function, but they're not necessarily creative. So it doesn't look great. It does what it needs to do, but it requires a designer or UX designer to make the, the buttons rounded, to make them you know, haptic feedback when you click on it, the thing vibrates, like all that sort of stuff is part of the user experience. And that's the color, the pixel size, the font, what chat GPT can take the style guide from the designer and apply it to this set of interfaces in a faster way than somebody actually coding it up and adding this pixel, this rounded edge. And that takes away a bunch of the effort, but still needs somebody to check the end of it. And that's a risk a very low risk of, you know, patient um, outcome, right? But it's super helpful. I used it recently. So I, I do a lot of Airtable and Excel stuff. And I was like, I need a formula that's going to extract this patient name. It's always after this. It's always before this, but it could be somewhere in this big line of text. And I, I said exactly that, what I've just said to chat GPT. And it created this Airtable formula, this Excel formula. Perfect. Like it was just put your field here and then I copied it into Excel and it worked perfectly. It was exactly what I needed. Yeah. So if, if you think about stuff like that, it's amazing. Using it as a tool to augment and challenge what you've decided is good. I would still challenge it. So yeah, it was actually interesting. Somebody wrote some history for a dog with Horner syndrome. And it didn't quite fit in my head. And I was like, wait a second, this should be a left-sided lesion, not a right-sided lesion. And I asked chat GPT and I said, I just copied the clinical science in there. And I said, hey, give me some neuro localizations for this. And it also got it what I thought was wrong. And it was the same side as that. And then I said, shouldn't, I just asked, shouldn't that be the left side? And it said, chat GPT goes, oh, I'm so sorry. You're right. This is a left side. Oh, side-side. yeah. No way. The other thing you can, you can do with that is you can load up. Actually, this is a bit of a admission of ch- not cheating. So I recently posted a LinkedIn post on the vet radiology and ultrasounds new issue on AI, machine learning, and radiology. I loaded up chatbot with the ACVR's position statement, the committee that I'm on, our findings, our suggestions, uh, the preface to the to the journal by Ryan Appleby. And I also got VetCT's recent position statement which echoed all of our feelings. And I also told it my favorite paper in there was by Nikki Kessel. And I said, write me a LinkedIn post that honors, obviously, the guest editor, but also all the other authors and mentions all of these things. And it wrote it out. It tagged all the authors. It gave me hashtags. I copied and pasted the whole thing and put it in LinkedIn. And it makes me look like I did this amazing work. And it's actually, you, you had to prime it a little bit, but you can use it to some advantage. But there, it's like, if I got some fact wrong, it doesn't matter. If we're doing clinical mm. cases and differentials and recommendations, that's where it's just not wise. I think you can definitely use it to challenge, and, and but make sure you're thinking about everything it says. All right, so it's AI and radiology, go. Yeah, so this is where some of the challenges come. So it's such an exciting technology that's come out. You know, it started back 2012. And now we're starting to see the fruits of some of this amazing algorithmic research. But the problem is, is that there are businesses out there that are trying to promote their AI to do some radiological triage and basic differentials or conclusions. Now, if if a drug company came out and said, we have a new anti-inflammatory drug, it works amazing on dogs and cats, especially I don't know, post-op, post-orthopedic procedures, but we can't tell you how it works. And we can't tell you how we've tested it. And we can't tell you anything in there, but for $10 each time, you can use it. And it's kind of, it's crazy that we find that absurd. But at the same time, we're going, hey, AI company, how have you tested, trained, and validated this technology. And 
the reason why that's important is that they might say that they've tested it on 10,000 thoracic studies out of, I don't know, some institution. What are the chances that your thoracic study, your three views of the thorax, maybe even two views, what are the chances that's the same quality as what they've trained the algorithm on? So if an algorithm comes out of the University of Tennessee, you know, a research and academic institution, their x-rays are probably 99% perfect. And they've trained this algorithm to recognize off of perfect studies. If I give it, you know, a standard GP practice where they're, you know, they're working two hours late and understaffed and it's a little bit rotated and the dog's conscious and halfway moving its neck during the x-ray. And there's that, a sandbag. That AI, <laughs> this is a sandbag. That algorithm is going to say, this is abnormal or this is a mass because it's only trained to go normal or abnormal. And if it's abnormal, pneumonia, mass, um, aspiration, pneumonia, mega esophagus, fibrosis, um, asthma. And it doesn't have a, a setting that goes rotated and conscious dog. Like it doesn't have that. So it's going to come up with a answer. And the answer is going to be based off of the fact that it's expecting gold standard x-rays. But the thing is, we don't know. And a lot of these companies aren't publishing what they've trained it on and how they've trained it and where the biases are. So the bias example here is that if this, say we um, were in Tibet and we have a lot of Tibetan mastiffs to train off of, again, I don't even know if Tibetan massives actually come from Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume so. Yeah, you so. So now we're going to train it saying, here's a normal Tibetan massive, a normal, a normal. This is an abnormal with a big heart, abnormal with a big heart. This is an abnormal with some disease that's only seen in Tibet. And we train it a hundred thousand times. And then we get a Tibetan mastiff in America. It doesn't get that disease, but when it gets something similar all of a sudden the AI is going, you have this rare disease that's only found in Tibet. And that's it. Boom. Right home to your to your owner. And the vets don't necessarily know that there's that hidden bias in there and the contraindication about using that AI. So ideally, the AI groups, and there are a lot of groups that are taking this latter approach where they're saying, this is how we've trained this AI. We've trained it on Rottweilers, Labradors, Dalmatians basically big dogs, if you give it a small dog, it will have less performance. It will have some challenges. So just, it won't know it and won't tell you, but just be aware that this works really well on Labradors. This doesn't work so well on Corgis. And that's the sort of transparency that I think is needed. And then lastly, they're training all this information on all these x-rays but how are they validating it? Are they going to another institution to get x-rays from something that they don't know, like these uncertain views? And are they coming back to see how well the algorithm is performing? Or are they testing it on the same stock of images that they've used to train it? You imagine if I train you on how to spot a foreign body and I give you the exact same x-ray again, you're going to be like, it's a foreign body. I've trained on it. I know what that is. Whereas if I give you a different dog from a different location and you're going to apply the principles, that's a different story. So it's really neat seeing commercial interests get a interesting technology out to the veterinary professionals who are absolutely asking for more support. Like there's not enough radiologists, there's more x-ray machines, there's more images. We need something, but how do we do that in a balanced, logical and careful process that we're not going to have negative patient outcomes without knowing that we're creating that sort of environment. And that's, that's the challenge right now. Um, I really, you know, is AI going to be here and helping us with our x-ray radiology reports in two years, five years, 10 years? Yes to all of that. It's just making sure we're doing it in a honest, transparent way. And there are some companies that are, are forging ahead with that path. And there's some other companies that are keeping everything very contained. And I'll just give an example of where this goes bad. Mm -hmm. A dog that is seen by colleague and uh, this is a few years ago and they find a nipple on the x-ray that looks like a nodule big nodule in any case it's dismissed as a nipple because it is a nipple and it goes away and comes back with a radiology report done by an ai company and the ai company says that's a metastatic lesion as in the algorithm says it's a metastatic nodule and they dismiss it and then 
subsequently, it comes back two years later and its lungs are full of Mets. And now all of a sudden, this vet's in trouble for missing something that they were questioned on. But in actual fact, it was always a nipple. It coincidentally developed metastatic disease, probably because it had a bone tumor. But this vet was pulled in front of the veterinary board because of something that happened after the fact. And AI assumed it was there at the start. And that sort of um, oversight and education is needed to say, what happened here? What are the claims coming and what are the limitations and was that accurate? And I think the the sort of blind claims are dangerous to both patient outcomes and professional standards. And But I'm excited. I'm super excited. So where we are now, 2023, are, are people, are they AI radiology reading software is available? Can I go and look for something now and hmm. install it in my practice and run yeah, my rads through? I'd say... Yeah, I'd say you probably find about five or six commercial companies that offer AI reading of thorax and abdomen x-rays. And and at this stage, so where are we now? February 2023. Are any of those good enough to be really useful? I think, no, I, I don't want to do that. I think they're all doing really exciting stuff. I think because it's such, it's an industry and a technology in its infant stages, they're not necessarily open to saying what their limitations are and mm-hmm. where the contraindications are and where their biases are because they're trying to sell a product and they're trying okay. to claim like to sell something like that. It's easy to say we are just as good as a radiologist or better than the average or all that. But in five years time, they might be able to say that, but at this stage it's just potentially challenging and dangerous to do so, mm-hmm. especially not, when they need to sort of explain how their algorithms work and how they won't work. And the commercial interests are too large to say, we're not going to divulge that information. So we're just at a bit of a loggerhead. Wow. Okay. It feels like a pub session. We've probably got to wrap it up at some point. Let's do, what are you listening to at the moment? Podcasts or audiobooks or anything, or have you listened to in the last few months that needs to go on the playlist? Uh, one of the podcasts I listen to, and, and I think it could potentially get some heat depending on, you know, a lot of this, uh, knee jerk reaction sort of stuff that kind of permeates through pop culture right now. But I, I like the all in podcast and the all in podcast is a group of, you know, they happen to be mostly billionaires, but they come from a broad spectrum of political positions. Some of them are Republican, some of them are democratic, but they cut through a lot of the current world events and business and and sort of economic events, giving perspectives from opposite sides. And they argue, they discuss, they challenge, and they call people out on that. And it's really refreshing to see that instead of it being a circle jerk or a hive mind in an echo forum, it just feels more, it feels nice listening to different perspectives and actually saying, wow, I didn't know. Like, and again, I don't agree with everything. It's just enough to I just don't like hearing so much of the same unchallenged or all these biased arguments. I'm just kind of sick of that. And I I really like hearing contradicting viewpoints. And just even if I disagree with it still at the end, at least I've kind of heard something. Mm, I like that a lot. The, that, that's sort of the non veterinary side. And then the veterinary side, I just, I I do like all the podcasts, you know, obviously not to plug yours, but I like, I enjoy hearing perspectives from a clinical and a non-clinical perspective experience as well um give us give us a plug what is your other most favorite veterinary podcast i'm happy to plug others who who i'm cheating on who i'm cheating on with yeah let me let me know (laughs) i mean my my love of my life will always be the vet ball but i do i do listen to other places no um (laughs) i'm enjoying toby trimble's podcast right now okay I'm. I like the Vet Innovation Podcast. Yeah, with the talker to Ivan, yep. uh, was that Sh- Sean and Ivan? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ivan's also got a consolidate that podcast, which yeah. is really interesting. It yeah. seems like there's a lot of galaxy stuff going in there right now, but it's just a really neat experiences on how independent practices can sort of compete against the consolidating business corporate world. Mm. I think those are probably the main veterinary podcasts that I listen to religiously, and. Uh, audiobooks are really like all the traction stuff. So traction and the Gino Wickman books are really good for business, sort of getting an oversight and a finger on your entire business. Because I felt completely out of control when these things are due and this thing pops up, like this just kind of brings that down in a manageable 
place. So if anybody doing anything business related, in fact, I think a lot of veterinary groups have sort of adopted this traction sort of yeah. philosophy yeah. to, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. There's a really good book by Reed Hastings from Netflix and Susan Meyer. They, they wrote a book about workplace culture and talent density and the example, which is great. They said, you know, a plumber, if you hired the best plumber in the world, they're probably maybe five times or at most 10 times better than the average plumber. But if you hired the world's best software developer, they might be 25, like 25,000 times better than the average. Like they might just be so dialed in to what they can achieve, but you don't have to pay them 25,000 times the salary. You can pay them twice or three times the salary and you get all this added efficiency. So they just talk about hiring and paying well or above average for really good people. And you get all the benefits of what they are compared to the average. Is that no rules rules? Yeah, it's no rules rules. It's just, just phenomenal. And, and you don't have to worry about what your staff are doing because you've hired appropriately. Like they're not going to take holiday out when it's not an appropriate time for you in the business. You've hired them and they have all of this in mind and you can put any one of your staff in front of a partner or an investor or, or anybody. And Is you it, know that you're going to be taken care of. So right? A lot of that sort of conversation from other businesses. So some of these business books, I find really interesting. And then you look at the vet profession and you go, yeah, I'd love to hire people like that, but I, I can't I'd even find to, anyone. Yeah. I can't even yeah. find anyone. Never mind the perfect person. I, <laughs> it's interesting, and I, like this is where I agree with with Sam. I think he talked about this on your podcast once as well. It's like they'll like, for example, if you're struggling to find a vet, and you're like, I cannot fire. It's like The Simpsons when. Um, Flanders' parents are needing help for their parenting. And they're like, we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, sure. Like they get to a certain point and they're like, well, what? <laughs> why don't you pay? Like, let's just jump a big percentage up. Like pay them a lot more. And they're like, well, what sort of precedent am I setting here? And it's like, you're going to be working with another vet while you're not working with understaff vets. Like you're, you're closing on Wednesday because you can't find the staff because you don't want to pay that extra 20, 25, 30%. Mm. And sure, like that doesn't mean that you're always going to be paying everybody 20, 25% more than the market, but the market forces change as well. And all of a sudden you're going to find yourself, if it goes the other way, it's like, well, we have less owners coming in. It's a recession. We can't afford this. We need to kind of find this happy medium. But I, I just hear a lot of vets when we can't find anyone. And I'm like, what are you paying? And that's like market rate. Right? Yeah, I, I had a conversation this week with a guy in a completely different business and they're having major issues with transport. Can't find truck drivers, can't find trucks. And then he said, yeah, the, the reason that a lot of the private truck companies can't find drivers is the mines are paying people 140K. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Like if you're totally outcompeted. So another person is struggling to get a CT tech. And, you know, the CT techs are in demand. These are human trained medical, like physics specialists to operate a CT and MR, and they can't get them to run their CT. And I said, so what are you doing? They're like, we just, we have to close down. I'm like, aren't they in demand from immigration side? And he's like, I don't know. And I'm like, hey, like, I'm pretty sure they're in demand. You can sponsor one from the Philippines or from Thailand. And these are human trained physics experts that run CT, CTs in their hospitals there sponsor them to come out, pay them appropriately. And, you know, like, it's just like, I, I feel like, again, I don't have a veterinary business, so I can't really talk to where to find good staff. I just, I think if the first person to take the plunge and pay above a, a ward rate and steal that vet and treat them well and steal that vet nurse and treat them well, I think is uh, maybe it's, maybe I'm naive. I'm, I'm sure I am. I'm sure people are going to get really pissed off with me, but they would be laughing because they're <laughs> they're not closed on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. All right. So your one question: you had a vet conference. You have well, you're on a veterinary podcast. One of your favorite ones. I don't know which one. You can pick, <laughs> <laughs> and you have the opportunity to give a message to all of the veterinary new grads in the world. Uh, what's your message? I'd say that the message is is that there's a hundred thousand different types of veterinary jobs out there. 
And when I graduated or before I graduated, my idea was you could be a small animal vet, a horse vet, a cattle vet, or a specialist. And that was it. And I think now looking back, you know, there are, at least from my vets that I graduated with and others that I've met along the way, there are so many different jobs across so many industries that are loosely or or directly affiliated with animal health. Mm -hmm. And some of these people have super fulfilling lives. Like I've got a mate that audits wildlife in, in, in across Australia and they they pay him to go out and dart camels and figure out what sort of ecological effect a certain species has on. And like, I would have never known that exists. And, you know, the fact that he's a vet, he's, he was in controlled substances for darting these animals. And, and that's just like super cool. He gets to camp every day. And I have other vet colleagues, or at least people I know that they assess veterinary business cases or veterinary technologies for like startups like myself and their vet background and commercial background helps them look at, how viable a veterinary solution is. You've got chief veterinary officers for other companies. You've got people that work in, I mean, it's, it's, I think what I thought was I heard about, you know, government vets like, oh, you're sitting in a desk in a cubicle, but some of these government vets are working in Borneo and they're working on, like, I think it's just amazing to see there's so many options and jobs up there. Don't necessarily think that it's restricted to just that clinic in that, that small console room with the fluorescent light. Like, I think there's just so many things out there that can make us happy. And hopefully, you know, talking from some privilege, um, hopefully everybody has the opportunity to find that. Lovely. Steve, I miss our chats, mate. This was epic. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And we're going to do this live when you come to Queensland, right? Going to do some live podcasting? Yes. Yeah, Yeah, it'll be fun. How are you feeling about work for the year ahead? We started this podcast to help you find ways to make your vet degree and the career you build around it fit with the life you want to live. Or if that's too ambitious, then at the very least, to make work not suck. And I personally thought that the answers to a fulfilling, happy career as a vet lay in personal growth and better workplaces and all of the other non-clinical stuff that we talk about. Which is true, but something that surprised me when we started doing the clinical podcasts was how big a role that played in my personal enjoyment of work. And judging by the feedback we get from our listeners, it's a common occurrence. Here's why I think it is. It sucks to feel in the dark with your cases, to feel green or rusty in your knowledge. You feel guilty because you feel like you should know more and you should be learning more, but you're also trying to have a life outside of it. So ongoing learning falls by the wayside. On the flip side, it's a really nice feeling to know your stuff. When you get that case, to know the answer. Or, if there isn't an answer, to know that it's not because of your lack of knowledge. It's just one of those cases. Competence breeds confidence, and confidence is key. And our clinical podcast is the easiest way to work on your competence. Little bits of growth, every week, with minimal effort on your part. Try it. It works. Join our growing community of Vetfeld nerds and get your mojo back at vvn.supercast.com.